you know, it's not really turning down the volume of diet culture, a $72 billion a year industry that makes money off of our insecurities. It's turning up the volume of our intuition because we can't control that, but we can control how we connect to ourselves. All right, welcome back to the Dr. Crockett Show. I am your host, Dr. Susan Crockett, and I am so honored to have my guest, Sam Blumenthal, R-D-N, here. I almost said R&D. That would be like research and development. He's so silly. Um, Sam is an intuitive dietitian. An intuitive eating dietitian. Intuitive eating dietitian. Wait, is there a different kind of dietitian than an eating dietitian? Um. no, <laughs> it goes along with eating. It's an intuitive eating thing, like the book that you have behind you. Correct. Yeah, it's- intuitive eating. Um, it was created in 1995 by two registered dietitians who were ultimately looking uh, for a way to make peace with food and body. We all need that. Yeah, it's uh, it's rooted in ten principles. I like to call them tools and not rules. Okay. Essentially, uh, to help kind of guide that exploration to a more peaceful relationship with food and body and that's what we're going to talk about today. we're going to talk about some of them today yeah about making peace with food which yeah. is a topic that all of us need to hear mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love for an opportunity to introduce yeah. a little bit of my mission and my intention yeah um so as you all now know my name is sam uh as we mentioned i'm a registered dietitian who specializes in intuitive eating and the way that i love to describe the work that i do is i totally find value in what we eat And I think there's also an incredible amount of value in the behaviors surrounding how we eat, not just what This keeps coming up. Mm. So we did a a couple episodes early in the Mm. show Mm -hmm. with a similar kind of um, theme, Mm -hmm. the similar kind of theme with uh, Deborah Kirsten. So if you um, haven't looked at those episodes, those are episodes three and four. Uh, We'll put the links below for you. But Sam has even different been on that and a lot more depth of nutritional information and uh so this is not a repeat of that show this is yeah. just uh, expanding on that yeah one could say perhaps another perspective yep. as well and all of these different frameworks and experiences with this topic um can all work in tandem together to support a very peaceful and conscious relationship with food um With intuitive eating, uh, another way that I like to describe it is it's really an approach to nutrition from that place of self-care versus self-control. Gosh, I don't even remember when food wasn't an issue about self-control and what I could eat or couldn't eat or, um, you know, what's on the plate today because, well, all the things. Yeah, and that makes sense given our society and how nutrition is painted in our culture, uh, solely through this very all or nothing lens that food is either good or it's bad. Food is fuel or medicine, and if it's not, it's not worth eating. And what I'm excited for the opportunity to do today is kind of unpack that a little bit deeper and explore this through a more compassionate and curious approach versus a lens of judgment. Judgment, yeah. Yeah. So are you going to tell us about the 10 principles of it? So I'm, you know what, perhaps we'll get into all 10 another time, but Uh we are going to talk about um, just a few of them today. And what's so interesting, you might be able to tell with that book back there, but it's a pretty thick book. And to uncover and get into extreme depth with every single principle, just it, I don't feel that it would really serve this conversation <laughs> today. We also don't have the time for that. It, it takes much longer than bone broth. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, more than 24 hours. Yes. And, you know, with that note as well, I truly believe that whatever relationship we've previously had or perhaps even currently have with food has truly served its purpose. And perhaps today, throughout this conversation and after this conversation, maybe we come to find that that purpose is no longer serving us. And that's okay. It was just a moment and it was a lesson that our soul needed to learn Mm -hmm. at this stage of our journey. And 
it's okay to let that go and learn something new or decide to think of it differently. Yeah, absolutely. And and the language that you're using really resonates with me. Um, and and I part of my story that I find to be really valuable in sharing, especially as we start to dive into a lot of the concepts we'll be talking about today, um, is that for 12 years of my life, I was a very competitive rhythmic gymnast. Yeah, you were um, a high-level athlete. Yeah, so when I was about 13 years old, I was on our national team. Wow. And with that came so many wonderful opportunities and friendships and travel and competition. Uh, And reflecting on that, from the age of five years old when I started, even well beyond after I retired from that athletic identity, food was only ever seen as something to restrict or something to control to solely shrink and minimize. Because you had to be as small as possible to be able to compete. Yes. And from a young age, we're taught that our self-worth and our value lives within the lack of space that we take up. And I have a lot of compassion for that younger version of myself and gratitude because living through these experiences has allowed me to approach this conversation today. Sure from that place of experience. And I don't think I'd be sitting here with you if I didn't have. If you hadn't had that experience. I have a similar story, but it's kind of the opposite end of the Mm -hmm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. I was really small growing up, Mm -hmm. small in height, but also really thin, Mm -hmm. Um, actually until I was about 30. And in my 20s, I became a doctor, entered residency, entered, you know, this world of surgery. And it, it, uh, I was shy and it did not do well for me to be small. Mm. Um, The small stature was a problem. I didn't carry enough weight Mm. physically and uh, especially is not the right word, but you know, when you say somebody has gravitas or, you know, the the weight to be respected, Mm -hmm. I started putting on weight and have had difficulty taking off weight somewhat because now I hold space. I have more space to be. It's the opposite of you needing to be tiny and not take up Mm. small space. It's the, I have a stature when I walk into a room. Mm. And I mean, there's other reasons that I've um, struggled with weight. I think that's a real common theme around the stage and age of life and Mm. menopause and being women that we can go way off of that today, but we're not going to. Uh, But that, that taking up space or not taking up space is such a it's an interesting idea because I think most of the time when people talk about our body image or our physical image or and the reasons for unhealthy um, weights and unhealthy ways that we manage our earth suit, mm-hmm. uh, very often it's more about the emotional eating or overeating or the eating the wrong carbs or the food that's not healthy for us, which certainly plays into it. But I think this concept of stature is uh, an interesting one and and needs more discussion. Yeah. And, you know, with that, through our conversation of both intuitive and mindful eating today, what I what I love to ask those I, I serve is if they would be willing, if you would be willing to put the weight loss piece on the back burner of our for our conversation today yeah. because what we have an opportunity to explore is how to heal our health promoting behaviors and weight itself isn't a behavior it's not it's an end result it's a neutral end product of how we behave perhaps and sometimes it can be out of our control yeah. as well and yeah. so what would it feel like? What can we learn? What can we discover? What more can we experience? How? What fulfillment can we derive when we work on letting go of making eating decisions based on what a scale says? Yeah. Because in, in that sense, what we're doing is relying on an external tool to guide our eating decisions. And again, morally, there is no bad or good in this conversation. The truth of that, the outcome of that is that our sense of self-trust becomes eroded. Oh. Mm. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in for a second. Mm -hmm. 
And what we have an opportunity to do is start rebuilding that sense of self-trust and prioritizing a number on, on a scale can be a barrier yeah, to that. definitely. So I'm excited to explore this conversation with putting body size and weight just on, on the, the back side. on the side. It's not even the conversation. Mm -mm. It's the bone broth that's on the back burner that's cooking right now. <laughs> and uh, perhaps explore this from a totally new perspective. And ultimately, at the end of this conversation, it truly does become somebody's choice to form their own discernment yeah whether or not this line of thinking is is something that they're curious about well and, i'm super curious yeah, about it yeah yeah so let's talk about okay. it okay yeah so we're gonna start by talking a little bit about the language that we use mm -hmm. around food mm -hmm. this is a tough one and an exciting one and yeah. an interesting one You're scaring all, me. <laughs> all packed all packed in one so the language that we use to describe food directly affects our relationship with food and then therefore our relationship with ourselves. So what I mean by this is we'll start off first with the shoulds. I want you to get curious. And for those of you listening, take a moment to get curious. How often do the shoulds show up in your line of thinking? Oh, gosh. Uh -huh. It's so often. Yeah. It's nonstop. That's a lot of suffering, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And to invite in a little bit of humor to this conversation, I like to say we're shoulding all over <laughs> ourselves when we think through the shoulds. Um, so when the shoulds show up, that's typically a sign that we're living in alignment with someone else's value. Okay. Right. So we're not in our own alignment or we call it attunement. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And all of this is body attunement. Um, and yeah, so when the shoulds come up, I, I like to be playful with myself. I'm like, oh, I, there it is. I notice it, right? I, I'm noticing, I'm thinking that I should eat this or I shouldn't eat that. Right. Okay, that makes sense. It's valid. This is the world that we live in. This is the, the water we're all swimming in. And I'm learning or I'm working on swapping the shoulds with what do I want or what do I need? That's a very different conversation, isn't it? What does my body want or need at this moment? And it might feel, I want to validate that if that feels a little foreign or unfamiliar <laughs> at first, we don't have experience doing that. Right. Right. Yeah. So like when I started doing life coach um, certification, we have the same common a conversation around emotions. Mm -hmm. So often we're not used to even thinking about, well, what am I feeling in this moment? Mm -hmm. And I think what you're getting at with the food in the intuitive eating is uh, kind of similar. Like mm -hmm. what listening, checking in with your body or checking in with your mind, what, saying, what am I really hungry for? What, what does that even look like? Mm -hmm. And also working to give ourselves unconditional, non-judgmental permission to do so. And I'll be honest, the first time I ever heard of that, I was like, wait a minute. So I can just eat Snickers, whatever I want. Yeah, Cheetos. Snickers, uh, Reese's, Oreos, Cheetos, what traditionally we think as quote unquote junk food or how my mom phrased it when I was a child, crab, right? Mm -hmm. If I can just eat whatever I want, whenever I want, how much of it I want, I'm never going to stop. And the truth of the matter is when we work to give ourselves permission to do something, something really beautiful happens in that space. And that's where we start to form discernment, which is our ability to say, well, okay, if I know I can have this thing, this Oreo, this Cheeto, this bag of Cheetos, this pack of Oreos, whenever I want, however much of it I want, wherever I want, is right now, is this quantity my loving choice? Well, that's a whole different conversation because mm -hmm. then you're not fighting with the resistance to the should. Exactly. <laughs> Because when we are living within these barriers and these rules and these shoulds and these expectations that we are welcoming into our lives, we are much more likely to make a choice that's very impulsive and reactive. It's like, screw this mentality. I already opened the bag. I might yeah. as well just finish the whole I was thing. Really the whole thing, yeah. And this truly is a skill. It's a good one to practice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 
that's one of the the forms of languages we can start or one of the one of the many verbiages we can start to uh, tap into and get curious about in the frequency of how often it shows up in our line of thinking, the shoulds. Okay. The second is in the form of morality. So this is in the form of good foods and bad foods. This is a hard one because as a physician, mm -hmm. we live in a world of right and wrong, good and bad, mm -hmm. healthy and not healthy, mm -hmm. especially as a surgeon. Like mm -hmm. my job is to cut out the sickness. Mm -hmm. And um, is it, and so this is a, a really good contrast to have a conversation with you. As a life coach, I know the language of neutralizing circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, food is a neutral, but I also know as a doctor, when you put different things in your body, they do, you get different results. So the way that we can reframe that, because what you're sharing is in incredibly valid, right? So is there a world in which both of these things can be true? And the answer is yes. And while living in this good or bad framework, as an example, if I eat something that I've labeled as good or society says is good, maybe like uh, a beautiful green salad and uh, a smoothie. Okay. When I eat that good thing, how do I, f how would you imagine I feel? Good. Good, right? I'm on track. I'm doing it right. Got a star. Mm hmm. But the moment that I cave, heavy air quotes, right, and I eat something that I've labeled as bad, I've been taught to believe is bad, society says is bad. Maybe it's my grandmother's chocolate chip cookies on Thanksgiving. Doesn't matter that my grandma made them, they're cookies, so that's bad, right? It's guilt and shame, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. remorse sometimes. And that's a lot of that is rooted in our mindset surrounding the food. The food itself has. It's, it's got uh, physical chemical properties. That's what food is. Uh huh. Yeah. We, our perception of it is what is almost eating us alive. Well, it kind of is because if you feel shame and guilt, then that's stressful. It increases your cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. And this gets into that whole conversation about how the, in, you know, what the environment is like when you're eating and, you know, that mm -hmm. level of, um, it's not just the macros in, macros out, calories in, calories out. It's uh, all of this stuff we've talked about before and eating with other people and using it as a relaxing getaway and your little three, two, one thing that you did, which is super fun. Um, and so med medically, the stress around mm -hmm. food comes out in our metabolic um, pathways. Yes. So... With that, labeling that food is bad, when I eat that bad thing, then of course I feel shame, I feel guilt. My diet starts Monday, which our bodies have no idea what day it is. <laughs> mm -mm. Right, that's another <laughs> external tool we're using, right? right? So when the good and bad shows up, a similar framework with the shoulds, playful. Oh, there it is, I notice I'm thinking, because again, we're not our thoughts, we experience thoughts. Right. And inserting that phrase, I notice, I'm thinking, is creating that sense of detachment. Right. So you, be, you become the watcher. So mm -hmm. our uh, viewers mm -hmm. are very, well, if you've been watching the show for some time, then you're familiar with uh, that concept. Mm -hmm. in, in life coaching, we talk about it mm -hmm. being uh, the toddler in the backseat. Mm -hmm. The brain is doing what it's supposed to do, which is responding to the environment around us. There's the subconscious, unconscious. And when we notice that it's acting in a way that is not how our higher brain wants mm -hmm. to work, our higher consciousness, we can say, okay, toddler, I hear you. You're doing what you're supposed to do, but I'm going to make a decision to do something differently. Absolutely. And that pathway of changing the thought changes our feelings and our actions and our results. Yes. This essence that our mindset affects our feelings and that our feelings affect our actions. And oftentimes when it comes to diet and nutrition, we see this narrative of just changing the action itself. And that's not leading towards sustainable change. And right. kind of the way to do it is starting first with mindset and noticing the language and the mindset that we have around food first and foremost, and kind of unpacking that and letting that older framework go if we're noticing it's no longer serving us today, especially if we notice that we're having 
obsessive food thoughts 24 7 or we're noticing that we are isolating and not participating in social life and health because whatever's on the menu is not going to fit within this guideline exactly the shoulds. the shoulds and so when the bad and good come up i see you that's valid i notice i'm thinking this and what would it feel like to work on substituting good and bad with nutrient dense and less nutrient dense maybe foods that give us long lasting energy or foods that give us short bursts right of energy because all food is going to give us something now when I'm sharing I don't believe in bad good or bad foods I do also want to make a note that I do believe some foods make our bodies feel good and some foods might make our bodies feel not so good well and some of what we are getting into at this point is not even food it's non-food substances added to our foods which are making us sick because our bodies are not meant to metabolize all kinds of chemicals and dyes and all of that. So that's, I think, a tangent of this topic. Mm -hmm. I think when you're talking about neutrality of food, as nutrition, we're speaking more of whole food, whole food, real foods, um, minimally processed or somewhat processed is like a different level. And then the the non-food level of stuff that's in our food now is a whole whole nother uh it can be it, or, yes i hear what i hear what you're saying and that's it's valid and the fear surrounding that can also be equally if not more detrimental to our wow. health wow <laughs> and we can still make the choice to say no thank you that food's not for me when the intention is coming from a place of self-care right versus self-control so it all comes back to the intention behind it and oftentimes we're almost making choices on autopilot we are with the label of saying oh these additives these this is bad i cannot have them i should not have them and then we're making those choices where walking through the journey of making peace with food learning the framework that all foods are are emotionally equivalent even if they're not nutritionally equivalent true we can start to form the discernment to say okay for the most part, maybe what fits my pattern of eating and what feels good from a place of self-care is saying no thank you to those foods while also holding compassion that maybe it's not feasible for me to have every single meal cooked at home with whole food identifiable ingredients. It's not. No, right? It's very hard. Yes. So sometimes if you're on the road or you are traveling and you know, the airport doesn't have any of the foods that you would typically have at home, I would much rather you find something to eat <laughs> than say, I'm, I'm not going to eat this thing. I'm going to ignore my hunger, ignore my body's cues, not rebuild that sense of self-trust just because I shouldn't be having yeah. those things, which can feel really scary yeah. at first. That's why this is not a light switch that flips on and off, that you're healed and everything's fine. Like, I'm still working on all this, truly. And you've been aware of this for years. Yeah, This is my third year working through this and myself, and I fully expect to continue working <laughs> on this for the rest of my life. Because, you know, it's not really turning down the volume of diet culture, a $72 billion a year industry that makes money off of our insecurities. It's turning up the volume of our intuition because we can't control that, but we can control how we connect to ourselves. And because there will constantly be all this noise surrounding us, for the rest of our lives. I can't spend my time, we can't spend our time and energy trying to mute that. Right. We have to learn to attune to ourselves. Exactly. This this one. You asked me about the dots before, about the color scheme. Yes. Each one of them is a topic for what we teach. Uh, please start from here. <laughs> I'm so curious now. They're, they're called, I call them the seven seeds of the soul. Oh. And um, so they go, let me see if I can do this. Um, be, heal, love, give, grow, pray and attune oh. so the b is uh self-care we start with self-care because you have to figure out your choices for how you want to be in this world and show up and take care of yourself and mm -hmm. you know it's that whole mom put on your mask first before you put it on the toddler mm -hmm. um heal is getting is the light pink one that's the 
getting rid of the things that are n- not in your not aligned with your m- mind, body, or soul. Mm-hmm. The dark pink one is love, which is love. The green one is give, which is um, it has to do not just with money. We talk about money and finances within that, um, but also how we give of our time and ourselves mm-hmm. to others and in what we give to the community and the world. That's our um, coming from inside to out and then grow is learn something new every day and continue to grow and learn lifelong learning pray is whatever your spiritual connecting to uh, whether you call it god or the universe or <laughs> nature or plants or we all have we all uh, we on this community in this community of the show we honor um people of all faiths and mm-hmm. So that that represents uh, communication with our spiritual being, and then the attunement is attuning not just like you're talking about to attune to yourself and be able to listen to your inner voice and make ch- choices that are in alignment with that. But it's also it's all relationships. So yeah. all the rest of them are more internal, like about mm. ourselves. And then this one is us as ourselves interacting with the world and other people around us. That's the relationship piece. Which all of them are are equally valuable forms of nourishment, right? Mm-hmm. And I love using the term nourishment beyond the realm of food yeah, because we don't that. necessarily think of it that way. And yeah. that's kind of why, not kind of, it's entirely why I'd like to say there is value in understanding both the difference and balance between feeling full and yeah. feeling fulfilled. That is so cool. Yeah, thank you're, you. You're welcome. You know, I think I'm uh, I'm going to say thank you for bringing this topic to our conversation today. I, um, I'm going to make a part one and part two of this interview because I think we have more to talk about. Perfect. And uh, so we're going to remind our viewers where they can find you. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're on Instagram, I'm fulfilled and full dot R D. Fulfilled is F U L F I L L E D. I had spelled it. Yeah. wrong for a while oh <laughs> f-u-l-l but That's no funny. f-u-l-f-i-l-l-e-d and full dot r-d and then on tiktok uh it's fulfilled and full um there you can find a bunch of different mindful eating tips and skits and things to yeah to be helpful reminders for continuing to get curious about the topics that we're talking about today that's awesome mm-hmm. so we'll put those uh links all in the show notes of course like you like we always do and if you found this uh, talk helpful, please share and like and help us grow our community and go visit Sam's site. And uh, we're going to do a part two of this conversation. So catch us next week. Thanks. Thanks.